Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. God and they get down on their knees and they begin to seek God for his favor, for his blessing, for his anointing, begin to seek God for his will to be done in their life. And that comes through prayer. And if not only do we need to see God's hand move here at praise, but our, our local governments need to see God's hand move. In just about 10 days, we have an election coming up for Mexico and Rumford citizens, and maybe a few other towns will be going to the polls to, to, to be voting. We're, uh, and this is a governor, this is a uh, governor's election. So there are many things that towns are going to be voting on. Uh, June 10th is the primary election. Uh, we have uh, many uh, select boards that are in chaos today. We have controversy over town managers and all kinds of things. We, have, we live in a state that needs God's hand to move in great and wonderful ways. And we certainly live in a country that whose uh, president lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The United States House of Representatives, the United States Senate, and right beside there is the Supreme Court, where we need God's hand and favor upon America again. But that's only going to come one way, and that's the way of prayer. It's only going to come, a great revival, a great move of God, is only going to come when God's people begin to pray. And I think it's really great when you have young children that were here tonight from fifth grade and younger that knew what it meant to pray and knew what it meant to what to pray for. And for God's favor and blessing and, and to have a, whether it was to have a good day or whether it was a huge uh, miracle of healing or Lord take us out of here. Jesus prayed for us to pray that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. And we're going to be looking at that Saturday night from Matthew chapter 6. But guys, we're going to get real serious about prayer. Some people, prayer doesn't shake them. I ask you the question, do you have a personal prayer life today? Do you get up earlier or find quality time to spend with God to pray? And to hear his voice. Not do ten other chores at the same time. But to get alone with God. And to pray. And as a body of believers. Corporately speaking. And we're going to be talking about this at that special business meeting. We're having on June 10th. As we discuss church finances. And membership responsibility. But in the assemblies of God. We are a corporate fellowship. That's what our official name. Is a corporate fellowship. Where, where believers come together and what the government calls a general assembly to do something. Well, we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship God, to learn about God, and most importantly, to seek His face together corporately. You cannot be in a corporate fellowship sitting at home watching Price is Right or Wheel of Fortune. To be a part of a corporate fellowship, you have to be there live and in color. That's what it's all about. And to come together corporately in prayer. And we're going to talk more about that in the last service, June 1st, Sunday morning, a corporate fellowship. But as part of the Assemblies of God, that's what we are, a corporate fellowship and prayer is the centerpiece. Well, this is not something that's brand new. The Assemblies of God is going to be 100 years old this year. But it wasn't brand new 100 years ago. A corporate fellowship and a corporate prayer meeting has been around since the days of Solomon. Since the days of the prophet Joel. Since the days of Abraham and Moses. Okay, corporate prayer is huge. For example, the prophet Joel, you know, when, when, when the, church, uh, the church was in chaos and there was so much phony baloney going on. And the prophet Joel called an all-night prayer meeting. Who did he call? He called the elders. He called the priests. And he called the people to come into the house of God to seek God all night long, if need be, until God answered their prayers. Think about that, church. And then you say, Pastor, what does that mean locally? Well, if you look at it, any corporate prayer meeting, whatever day of the week it is that we had, by far is the least attended. 
I knew, I'll be honest with you, I knew attendance would be down simply because of what this pink flyer said. Prayer week. That's boring. Wow. How sad is that? When we make a statement like that. Well, church, prayer is, prayer is so, if we want a revival, how many of you want a revival? Amen. Well, let me tell you the price. Prayer. Amen. It's not coming any other way. Before they had the upper room experience and God poured out His Spirit at Pentecost, those brothers were in prayer for how many days? Who knows? No. Ten. Ten days. Jesus was on the earth 40 days and they tarried in the upper room for ten days praying and seeking God. And what were they doing? They were doing that corporately. They were all there, live and in color. They were all, all the disciples and their families were there live and in color. And tonight, as, as, as we, and the sermon won't be as long tonight because I want us to find special places to pray, but we're going to do things a little differently. And so hold on to your hat because we're almost going to bring a piece of that upper room and begin to bring that into us here corporately as a corporate fellowship. I wonder how many of us as families pray together. There's an old saying in the South, those that pray together, stay together. I hear that every now and then up here in Maine. Okay, but how many of us as families pray together as far as just corporate prayer in the home? You know, that doesn't happen as often as we would like. And I was uh, talking to someone uh, not too long ago about the importance of prayer. And for many people, it doesn't shake anybody anymore. As I said earlier, it doesn't shake people. But I don't care what it, if it shakes people, and I care if it shakes God. God loves it when his people come together as a body to seek him. Parents of older adult children, don't you love it when your children come home at Thanksgiving? Don't you? My mother, she loves that. When we came home at Christmas and all those kids were around the table, that was pretty awesome. You know, God loves it. When his sons and his daughters come into a time of prayer to seek his face. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's word. And tonight's title of tonight's message is Solomon's Prayer and God's Response. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7 beginning at verse 11. If you cannot find it or do not have a Bible either paper or on your phone or any other place you might be able to use a Bible. It's on the screen for you. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, beginning with verse 11 down to verse 22, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Brandon, can you turn me back just a tad bit, brother, or just a tad bit? Thank you. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, beginning with verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my, eye, my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house and my name will be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man as a ruler in Israel. But if you turn away from if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land which I have given them. And this house which I have sanctified for my name I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. 
And as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done this to this land and this house? Then they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt and embraced their gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore he has brought all this calamity on them. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now guys, most of us are familiar with 2 Chronicles 7.14, but most people do not know the context. They have no idea that God is responding to Solomon praying after he has just dedicated God's house to him. Now this is right before Solomon falls off the truck. This is about the 13th, some scholars say the 13th, somewhere between the 13th and 17th year of his reign, which the first part was very righteous, and then he forgot who God was. He forgot the importance of following the Word of God. Well, I think many Christians have made the same mistake. But you know what I believe more than anything here tonight? Is that that mistake starts to happen when people forget to pray. When prayer goes out the window... Solomon, he said a corporate prayer. If you read the first ten verses of Solo, of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, you will see an awesome prayer from King Solomon. You will see a man who not had a problem with women, a man who had a not, did not have a problem with lying lips. This was a man who was walking with God just as his father, King David, was walking with God. This was a man that was close, and he corporately had a prayer meeting for the, for the Israelites in God's house to come and to hear and to respond to. All right, so Solomon, he understood, and God responded to Solomon's prayer. Basically, tonight is the response to that prayer. Most people, when they hear uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, they're at the National Day of Prayer, or they're listening to somebody rake the president over the coals, or rake America over the coals for how far we've gone since we had prayer and Bible reading in schools. Well, church, there's so much more to this verse than just, you know, America. This is God's response to an awesome prayer. I will tell you tonight, God's going to respond to some of you tonight if you'll speak to Him. I believe fully God is going to respond if our attitude is right. And we're going to, fo we're going to follow as we break down these verses quickly tonight. We'll find out that God desperately wants us to speak to Him. Amen. Desperately. Usually the only time that the Father reveals the Son first and speaks first is when that person comes to know Christ. After that, when you come to the foot of the cross, most of the time God wants us to make the first move. Corporately, God is desiring to see us step out of the boat. God is desiring us to go deeper and to become men and women of prayer. Verse 11, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, his own house. And Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. See, this is, this is where I think Solomon began to fall off the truck. Early in his reign, he had already reached all the goals he wanted. And you know, sometimes we get to that point. We say, well, you know what? I've arrived. I've reached where I want to reach. And then, so that moves us away from prayer. I've got money in the bank. My kids are well. I've got good health. I've got a roof over my head. You know, I have an education, all these other things. And then the world kind of just swallows us up. That's exactly what happened to King Solomon. He had arrived early on in his reign. So what else more do I have to do? Well, you know, in God's response, as we look at his response, God knew where Solomon would go. God knew Solomon's heart, which is why we're going to read here in a minute. If you obey, I'm going to bless. If you're like your father, I'll bless you. If you go into the world, I'm going to curse you, as well as your people. And the Israelites were cursed for 2,800 years because of King Solomon's sin. History tells us that. We know that. Europe had to deal with that. America had to deal with that with World War II and the uprising of Adolf Hitler and his followers. Which, for the record, those guys have not all died, by the way. There's another move and another push to see the Jewish people destroyed. But church, let me just say this. When you go to God tonight in prayer, and if he gives you an ultimatum of some kind, or if he gives you the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life, praise him for it, and, let, and it's important that you know God knows your heart. He knows your strengths, and he knows your weaknesses. He knows what's going to keep you on the right path. Yesterday in Extra Innings, we talked about staying on that narrow path and how easy it is to get off track. 
Take the easy road. It's easy not to pray. Tell you what, Sunday school answers, Bible and prayer, it's the two hardest things you'll ever do. We call them off like they're nothing, but they're very difficult. Very difficult. All right? And, and I think there are many churches closing today, many churches dying today, because they, they forgot the importance of prayer. So here we go. Here's the response. Verse 12, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. Now this is the second time the Lord had appeared to Solomon. And if you remember about a year and a half ago, I preached on that first appearance of God to Solomon after David, his father, had died and Solomon had become king. But verse number 12, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. The Lord is here tonight. It is nighttime. After 6 o'clock, is considered the evening and nighttime, even though it's still light outside, you know, and that's because of daylight savings time, actually. It would actually be getting kind of dark if we didn't make man-made time, if you will. Okay, but here, then, then, uh, then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. God's going to hear your prayer, too. The question is, do you know what to pray? Do you know what to pray? Well, as we break down this response to God, I believe God's going to start to lay on your heart. Maybe before you even go any further, you need to repent and get right with God. Maybe you need to say, Lord, I, I've been chasing the wrong thing, and I need to get back on the narrow gate, the narrow way. Or, Lord, maybe I just needed an adjustment, and I need to come and give you a prayer of thanksgiving. Lord, thank you for speaking to me. That's okay. That's still prayer. But wherever you're at tonight... God is going to speak to you if you will speak to him. And then, then he goes on to say this. I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. That place is talking about the temple that King Solomon and the nation of Israel had built for a house of worship unto the Lord. Guess what? We are in God's house here tonight. Our motto is a house of prayer. We are here to pray. We are trying to reverence the sanctuary as much as we can because we want people to know this is a place of prayer. This is a place where we can seek God. This is not a place, though, guys, where we just rub God's like a genie in a bottle and rub and get three wishes and expect God just to pop out and go bang, bang, bang. That's not how it works. God's looking at your heart tonight. God is wanting us to desperately be in an attitude, not just of worship, but an attitude of prayer. And God told Solomon, I have set this place as a place of sacrifice. A place where God is going to be lifted up. Verse 13, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locust to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Why does God go right into something negative as he's responding? Because God knew the heart of Solomon. God knew he would have to speak early and often to Solomon about disobedience. If you read David's reign, especially the last half of his reign, God wanted to do nothing but bless the people of Israel. God, if you look at a map and you see how small Israel is today, about the size of New Jersey, if you look at a map and see how large Israel was during King David's reign, the nation was huge. God's blessing was upon them. In some of your Bibles, you may see a map of King David's empire, if you will, or Israel under King David. God had moved mightily. But right off the bat, God had to get serious and say, you know what, I may send pestilence among my people. Why is God doing that? Because God knew Solomon's heart. As you go to speak to God tonight, God may challenge you. You know, God may say something to you. You know what, the next time it might be age you contract. Or another STD, a sexually transmitted disease. Play with fire, you're going to get burned. The next time, you know, you, you put something in your body or pop a pill or, or shoot up, you might die. Wow, it's getting quiet in here. Church, the things I deal with every day, if you only knew. I'd long for someone to say, Pastor, I'd love to shadow you. I'm not just sitting up there eating. Well, today I was sitting up there eating peanut butter cookies, but usually I'm not just sitting up there eating peanut butter cookies with my feet propped up. Okay, that's usually not happening. These things, these things are very real. Here in our area, we now have a, a heroin and a crack out, uh, rise that's taking place. You know, we have a pretty good grade weed that's coming into town. Not the cheap stuff, but the good stuff, and it's causing people to go, you know, broke. It's, uh, we have pills going everywhere. You know, we have all these things. So as you go to God, God may say, you know what? The last time I saved you, when you were sitting under the bridge shooting up, it will be the last time that I saved you. To wake you up. 
Solomon was getting, like, can you imagine how Solomon must have felt at this time? He just gave an awesome prayer of dedication. He had just had this temple. It took Solomon 10 plus years to finish the temple for God. And here is God's response. I'm going to bring pestilence upon you. He looked right to his heart. He knew Solomon wasn't sold out like David was. He knew Solomon didn't want the revival. He knew that Solomon didn't want to be as David was a man after God's own heart. And he saw right through it. And he said, I may bring pestilence upon this land. Wow, church. This is huge. This is huge. You can come and give a wonderful prayer. I heard that. I've heard that many times. Pastor, I just love how you pray. You know what? You can have the most eloquent prayers in the world. But if it's not true blue, God's going to see right through it and pestilence may come your way. So when you go to prayer, be, expect God to speak to you, maybe, maybe sternly right off the bat. Don't get upset with God. Begin to thank Him and say, Lord, thank you for saving my life. Many of you, if you were to be honest, by the way and things you've done, could be very easily dead tonight. Very easily dead. Every one of us could be dead by our actions. But if it wasn't for the grace of God. Wow, church. So don't get upset with God if He gets stern with you tonight. Begin to thank Him. Because God's looking into your heart. Verse number four, 14 is, is, is the second half of that, of verse 13, really. But this is the verse everybody quotes as if it's its own verse. But it's really not. It's just the beginning of God's response. And He goes on to say, If my people, the Israelites, God's chosen people, followers of God, which is us, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves. Church, prayer requires humility. God was looking for humility. Don't just come up here because I need something, I need something, I need something. Again, God is not a genie in a bottle. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's looking for humility. And we're believers in Jesus Christ. We are. If you're a believer here, you are called by the Lord. Your body now belongs to the Lord. You, you need to be that person of humility when we go to God in prayer. I'm really excited because next Sunday, June 8th, is Pentecost Sunday. But I'm really excited because on Father's Day Sunday, we're going to be starting a three-part series on the blessings of God. I'm really looking forward to it by how God can bless us. And God can do great things. Mary and I are really excited because many of you know that we've been uh, praying and uh, trying to purchase the house down the street from us, a four-acre horse farm, and, and we've been trying to purchase that uh, to, to get our, my parents up here, since my mom's health hasn't been good, uh, to get into foster care because our current house does not uh, meet the requirements by the state of Maine. Our windows are too small, our doors too small, all that other nonsense. You know, we've been trusting the Lord but we say, Lord, we know it is your desire. If we just remain faithful, you'll be faithful to us. And let me just say this, guys. And I'm not doing this to toot my own horn. I'm doing this to toot the horn of Jesus Christ. And that is simply this. On Monday, June the 2nd, at 11 a.m., we're rolling up into the attorney's office to close on that house. Woo! Praise the Lord. And we're buying that house, guys. I'm excited. We're buying that house for half the price when we first started five years ago. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. I told my, called my parents and said, Mom, get pack your bags. you got a room. Amen. And you can get your sanity again. Wow. But God can move. So I'm really excited about the blessings of God. So don't anybody think God doesn't want to bless. God does want to bless us. He wants to give us good health. He wants to heal us. He wants to meet our needs as we're faithful to Him. He wants to open and find favor upon our life. You know, He wants us to be like the widow where the oil just kept multiplying over and over and over. You know, there in Elijah with 1 Kings chapter 17. He wants to bless. and do, So I'm looking forward to that. So don't anybody get, you know, as we look at the sternness of the first part of God's reply, don't get too upset. But get serious with God. If, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and I will uh, hear, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Church, if we're going to pray, God's going to speak to us and he's going to speak righteousness into our life. We're not, God's not wanting us to serve two masters. As believers, we are to be set apart. 
As people of prayer, we are to be set apart. If you say, well, I'm going to hide that from God. I'm just going to come out and seek God. Let me tell you, God's going to see right through you. God's going to see. It's just like a parent who knows when their children are lying. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. You know when your children are shucking and jiving you. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, and so God does too. So we, when we go to God in prayer, we have to go with humility. We have to seek his face and pray, which is what we're going to do here in just a few moments. We have to say, you know what, Lord? I am repenting. I'm turning from my wicked way. We're all firing on Washington, D.C. You know, we're all guilty of it. But you know where revival in America starts? It starts with each and every one of us. The silent majority. The grassroots of revival moving forth. And it starts here at 89 Congress Street. And we're going to take it to Augusta, Maine. And then travel down 95 to Washington, D.C. And God, God's voice will be heard in us. That can start with one church. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? I tell you what. George Whitfield has started in one church in Rhode Island. And a great awakening broke out. Pentecost in the upper room. It started in one place, the upper room. The Acts class, I believe you studied that. And how it spread all across the world at that time. And it can do the same thing here. But the Lord says, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Where does it start? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Pray is the centerpiece of it. We can't do this without prayer. Prayer shouldn't be boring. If prayer is boring to you, then you're telling Jesus Christ he's boring. You're a boring friend. Prayer is simply talking to God. And God has a lot to say to us. Say, Pastor, I don't hear him say anything to me. When I hear that, that tells me somebody hasn't been praying. Because I know God will speak. I know God. You can't say, well, well, I want God to answer my prayer, but I want to keep doing this thing, that thing, and this thing. You know, rob, cheat, and steal, and, and live like the devil and all that. Then expect things to go quiet because the Bible does say what will make God's voice go mute is sin. Disobedience will turn God off. What separates us from God? Sin. So we have to be humble and repent and turn from that sin and pray. All right, so it's very, it's very important, and God is serious. And think again how Solomon must have been feeling. Solomon thought, he, wow, I've arrived. I've done all this for God. This is great. And God's seeing right through all that and getting to the real deal. Verse number 15, now my eyes will be open, my ears attended to prayer made in this place. What's the Lord saying? His eyes and ears will be open to the prayers you say here. He'll be attentive to what you have to say. God's not going to shut you down, no matter what it might be. You say, Pastor, I've done all these things. I, I'm feeling convicted. Well, welcome, well, welcome. I tell people, if I don't feel convicted, I don't feel like I've been to church. I, I'd like my toes to be stepped on every now and then. Because I know I'm not God. You know? I do. I, I want to be challenged stepping into God's house and hearing what He has to say. You know, from His, uh, from his Word or however it may be. Verse number 16, For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually, which means for a long time. Church, why are so many churches closing down today? For every church we open, we're closing three. Why is that? Why is God's presence not there? Well, God's going to answer that question himself in this response to Solomon, including to his own house, his own temple that Solomon had built for him 3,000 years ago. Why is that? God wants his... God wants his name to reign. I know of a lot of good churches that were thriving churches in the 80s when I was a kid, and they're now antique shops and bars today. Some of them are right here in the River Valley. You know great thriving churches that used to be here in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, but they're no more. They're, they're coming, they're turning into dance halls and theaters and everything else under the sun. But look at, look at what God says here. Look at what he says, verse 17, As for you, talking to King Solomon, if you walk before me as your father David walked, and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my, my statutes and my commandments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom, as I covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. So God is going to bless Israel if Solomon is obedient. Blessed is the nation whose God is Lord. God is going to bless America if our president begins to seek and to live out the righteousness of God, which is why you need to pray for him. I don't care if you don't like him or not. You need to pray for him. 
You need to pray for the leaders in authority. Could you imagine if our president caught fire for Jesus Christ, how that would just move? It'd be like Constantine when he came to know God in 321 AD and a great move of God went around this world. All right, could you imagine if that happened? But here, this is important stuff. And so, as God is responding to Solomon's awesome prayer, he says in verse number, uh, but, uh, verse 19, but if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, with, uh, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them, and this house, which I have sanctified for my name, will be cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. Which means God will just let it fall apart. Wow. We're getting serious. Remember, that's how we open tonight, by getting serious with God. Prayer is huge to God. God does not want anybody coming into his house and making a mockery out of the house of God. Making a mockery out of a righteous nation. Such as Israel, which was so close to God, but God saw through Solomon because he knew where Solomon was going to lead his nation. And like I said, Israel had to suffer for 2,800 years. People say all the time, Pastor, why did God allow Hitler to come to power? Because he had to wake up his people. And he did. Israel became a nation again in 1948. And the prophet Ezekiel said, as the dry bones come alive would lead to the second coming of the Messiah. Matter of fact, the same generation, Jesus said in Matthew, the same generation that saw that take place would see his second coming. In America, we call that the baby boom generation. That's pretty cool stuff when you think about that. But he says here that God will uproot that. His house will fall apart. Church, does anybody here want praise assembly to fall apart? People ask me all the time, Pastor, how is it that the church is growing? How is it that God's favor is upon your life? I was just asked that question yesterday at pastor's prayer meeting. And you know what I told them uh, yesterday's pastor's meeting? is Saturday night prayer meeting. I will go to my grave believing that. When we saw God's hand start to move was on September the 8th, 2008, when we started having prayer meeting on Saturday nights. And we stuck with it. We had tried other nights. We tried Sunday night. We tried Friday night. We tried making it part of Wednesday night service. Attendance was just stayed the same. Where we said, you know what? We're doing Saturday night. This is where it's at. No matter who comes, this is what we're going to do. And you know what? We saw God's hand start to move. Prayer. Raj can tell you. He was there. And it's all, it was five and a half years ago we've been doing this. And, but a church prayer is so important. We need prayer in the home. We need prayer at school. We need prayer, uh, you know, in God's house. But I'll tell you, prayer is missing corporately. If we don't understand the importance of prayer week like this here this week, God's favor can go bye-bye. There can be other issues. We're, we're in uh, strong negotiations now with the owner of this building. We're, you know, we're here and we're struggling financially because only 57% of the church is tithing. 57%. The lowest it's been since 2004. Crystal did those numbers for me. Wow, that's 10 years, guys. It's 10 years. Some of our kiddos weren't around in 2004. All right? And, and, and so we need God's hand to move. We need God's hand to move greatly. How's that going to happen? When God's people begin to pray. When God's people begin to come together and to seek his face. And understand, though, that if we don't do these things, then God's house which was sanctified and set apart. The house that Solomon had built for him was set apart from God, and God just let it go bye-bye because of sin and prayer that was made out of mockery. Verse number 21, the Lord says this in his response, As for this house which is exalted, every, everyone who passes by will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done this to this land and this house? Why is God letting all these churches close? Why is that happening, Pastor? Why is it for every church we see open, three are closing? Why is that? Why is God allowing that? God will not put his name on trash. He will not put his name on unrighteousness. He will not put his name on mockery. It's not happening, church. God is not going to watch people. You know, do all these certain things. There are assemblies of God churches who get in there and worship God, and during the week they have a yoga class going on. That's not happening. God's not going to sit by and just watch that take place. 
You know, that is going to fall apart. That's going to become an antique shop. That's going to become, wow, that used to be a beautiful place. Wow. Not that those people are trash, because we're all, we're creating an image of God. God wants to save them. But the stuff we're doing is rubbish, the King James calls it, is rubbish. I think New King James cleans it up a little bit and says unwanted things. But it's rubbish that God does, God does not want his name on that. And he's saying it right here to Solomon. You know what happened? That temple went bye-bye. It did. Because of sin. Solomon didn't heed the words of God. You could say he forgot this. Some of you here tonight, maybe you'll forget the, that as you come and pray here in just a moment and God speaks to you. I pray no one forgets what God tells them. Don't forget. Think about it. When we had the prayer meeting on my birthday, that's why I remember it, when the, you guys did that little party thing and, and so many people came out on March the 15th of this year and, and God just laid on my heart to give a word of knowledge, which is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit from 1 Chron for First Corinthians uh, chapter 12. A word, and I'm praying, Lord, may no one forget what was said that night because some things are already coming out. I'm thinking, Lord, you, try, you let them know there's going to be a something new. You let them know, yes, there's some trouble on the horizon, but stay close to God. Amen. Amen. Blessing is going to come. Amen. I remember telling one, if you're faithful with small things, God will be faithful. God will bless you with larger things. Amen. You know, we, and we, you, guys, you guys were here, and we went around the whole circle. Amen. Wow. I pray nobody's forgot that. God is speaking to us. He has a lot he wants to say to us. But guys, it's important that we understand that we can't mock God. And I'm not saying that we're... I'm saying let's, let's keep our eye on the Lord. Let's be a prayer-centered people so that our church doesn't close. One pastor was saying yesterday, requested prayer. You know what? I'm just getting to the end of my rope. I don't think, I don't think we, can, we can go another year like this. Please pray. Because this is what he said. If I leave, this church will probably close. It'll be another antique shop, another theater, another house that used to be a place where God's people worshipped him. And now they've become places where drunkenness happens every Friday night at a place in which God's word used to come from the pulpits. What will the people say? Verse 22, then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt, the Exodus story, for those of you that don't know what that means, when God brought his people through Moses and then Joshua out of 400 years of bondage and slavery, out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, he, the God of this universe, has brought all this calamity or disaster on them. Guys, may we be people of prayer. God's response to Solomon was not easy. This, as we open this prayer crusade, I know this is not easy. But when you're working with people 70 hours a week, and you're seeing one thing after another taking place, you're seeing bad news, overdose, mental health breakdown, uh, you're seeing uh, foreclosure and pain and domestic disputes, and arrest taking place. As you're seeing homelessness and addiction and all these things running wild. We need God in the River Valley. We need God like never before. And you know what? I'm not talking about just people in the community. I'm talking about people that come and keep these chairs warm every week. We need to be people of prayer. We, and it starts with us. It starts with us here at Praise. We believe in the power of prayer. The Assemblies of God, our 12th fundamental truth is divine healing. We believe in miracles. Amen. We believe in God moving mightily. We believe in that like never before. The question is, church, do you believe? Do you believe in the seriousness of God's response to King Solomon after he prayed a great prayer of dedication over God's temple, over God's house? Beautiful place. Took 10 plus years to build. Beautiful place. And God's opening line. I'm going to bring pestilence upon you. If you sin. Wow. If you forget the ways of King David. 
Guys, may we not forget the righteousness of God. May we not forget who we are. We have some big decisions coming up. When we sit in our ministry team meetings the, first, the second and fourth Thursday of each month, we're not just up there count, counting how many pencils we want to buy. We're looking at some serious spiritual issues, some serious matters, some things that, that, quite frankly, are a matter of life and death, heaven or hell. We're looking at some serious things. And I implore you, I, I pray just as, as, as Jesus, I'm doing a series on the, personally, doing a series on the, the sermons that Jesus preached from the Gospels. And I'm finished Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there are over 101 topics Jesus preached on to the multitudes in three and a half years. And that doesn't count John that I have found so far. But one of those things is where Jesus said, I implore you, I desire greatly that you compel people to come in and to hear the gospel. And that I will pour out my spirit and I will do great things if you share the gospel that I am sharing unto you. God wants to do signs and wonders, but he says this, it will not happen without prayer and fasting. Huge pieces. Huge pieces. This is what I want us to do tonight. This is what I want us to do. I told the ministry team, I said, guys, I want you to, to be in prayer and to be ready in and out of season. We're going to do a little different tonight. And we have... Uh, we have uh, three of our, uh, three, well, four, but, but three of our deacons here. And this is what I want you to do. I want Erica and, and Alex, Erica and your family, Erica's one of our deacons. I want you to come over to this side right here, this wing right here. All right. Vince, come on up here with your family, up here to where your wife is and your daughter. With, come with them, brother. Andy and your family, I want you to go over to this wing over here. Everybody else, stay put. This is what we're going to do. All right? Honey, you can come on up to the piano if you want. And we're going to get serious with God. But we're going to, we're going to count off by threes. All right? Per family. And if, and uh, okay, so your family. If, if you're, whoever you came with, that's what family you're a part of, okay? All right? So that's what we're going to do. All right? Here we go. Right here in the front. One, you're with them. Two, ranks, three. You're number three, okay? All right, you'd be number one. You can come with them. Yeah, you can, you can come with them. Logic, you're number two. Three, you, you came with them. No, not you. One, two, Rob. I came with these. Okay, so you guys are all big fam? Okay, three. All right. One, Brady, you're two. If you're number one, I want you to go sit over with Erica. If you're number two, come up and sit with Vince. If you're number three, go over where Andy and uh, Brandy and Chloe are. Don't again. All right, but well, wait for instructions. Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services, Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m., worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel in the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.